Hello everybody, this is your host Nino and tonight we shall be talking about proper creep equipment. <laughs> and certainly young Sharon Stone has a lot to do with it. For once upon a time in the early 90s she played in a movie named Sliver, which is terribly navy and takes all the pleasure out of it by a very simplistic whodunit story, but it does contain something which I would say even rivals young Sharon in absolute gorgeousness, namely a surveillance system. See, the movie is essentially featuring a creep which is owing an apartment house and where he has installed a lot of cameras in order to peek into the lives of those who live in there. Now, the need of such an awesome surveillance system is something we clearly feel today as much as it was felt in 1993. And uh, there is no point in being ashamed of that. After all, that would be a passion we share with renowned socialite, Mr. Burns. <laughs> so, what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, this is our first of two videos on installing a home surveillance system, self-made of course. The first one featuring a Raspberry Pi Model 4, B4, and the second one will be on using ESP32 microcontrollers. And in this video I will show you what the result looks like and how it is configured. In fact there are two options of configuring it uh, on the Raspberry Pi. One of them will be reacting to motion and the other one will be just simply taking periodic pictures. And now let us jump in into the matter of today. Now it's clear that what you all want to see is the actual setup in a physical way, right? So that is really it. Here you're having here the four cameras and they are connected over a USB hub to a, a rather noisy Raspberry Pi 4. I heard that uh, it's necessary to have it run with a fan because it otherwise gets too hot and I mean if that were used to observe young Sharon Stone, I would understand why it would be getting hot. But <laughs> the fan is actually so loud, and that seems to be a common problem, that I am not sure whether the heat and the thereby resulting performance loss due to CPU throttling might not be actually acceptable. So that's what it really sounds like. It's a bit of a bzzz all the time. What you can use as an internet connection, and that I find actually not a bad solution, is such an internet stick. Now times here have become much easier than they used to be, because in the past, when I did this in 2013, you actually still had to send to that stick modem commands, but Nowadays, these sticks appear just as a virtual Ethernet interface and they just give you an IP address and that's it. They self-configure, you do nothing about them. You just insert a SD card and you're done with it. This is also a big improvement because it allows you to simply use them even if provider settings change. I've had that in the past that I set up my modem in some nice way, then the provider changed some um, access modalities and then my preset scripts no longer worked. That way everything will work guaranteed all the time. So 
I do recommend you that. And connecting it to the Pi and not having it as an external router gives you one further interesting sort of bonus, namely that you can restart the stick each time you restart the Raspberry Pi. As I shall outline in a moment, it is a good idea to periodically reboot your Raspberry Pi in order to sort of declog it. Like, I have noted that consumer electronics, be it due to the camera or the stick or the network provider or whatever else, tend to not work for very extended periods of time. It turns out to be a rather hard to let something run for three months, four months, or something like that. So having the entire installation be connected to the Pi itself, yeah, I'm using a USB hub, as you can see here, connected below that stick, is an advantage in order to have periodic refreshes. So that Hydra, or multi-headed dragon, or whatever you would like to call it, shall be the object of our further explorations and immediately now follows all the detail on the software setup. Now let's look at the actual program used and at its configuration. What I use is in fact a classic on Raspberry Pi called Motion. Motion is a program which you just install by apt install motion, which can run both directly and as a daemon, and which is essentially detecting motion by comparing pixel changes. That is, it periodically takes images and it compares each image to the previous one, whether it differs in a significant amount of pixels to a significant degree and if so, it calls it motion and takes a picture and stores it in a pre-configured directory. Now, motion's main configuration file is motion.conf and it is in fact, when you install it, calibrated to work with your first and only camera. The problem of this is, first of all, motion is way too chatty. That is, it saves too many pictures and thereby uses a lot of space. Space itself is not the only concern. If you want to make a surveillance system, likely you would like to see from a remote position what is happening at the target place. So not only do you want to install a motion detection or camera surveillance system in general, but you would also like to see what there happens. So you want to be conservative about the bandwidth you're going to use, in particular if you're using a remote mobile connection and gigabytes matter, and, and therefore you would like to minimize things a little. I will now guide you through my own motion configuration. And, and explain a few specifics. But before that, why do we have actually here so many motion configuration files? Like you can see here, not only the main one, but somehow one, two, three, and four. That has to do with the limitation of the USB bus. Now, if you're using a USB camera, which I do, in fact, I use four, you quickly discover that one USB controller, like the measly one apparently on the Raspberry Pi 4, which hasn't much improved since Raspberry Pi 1 days, if I correctly remember, when it is the last time I did this, nine years ago, can handle only one camera. Basically, one camera suffocates and chokes it totally. If you would like to use a second camera, which motion.conf completely allows you to do, that's not a motion limitation, you can use there a lot of cameras, um, then, then unfortunately your second camera is just delivering gray pictures. I mean, just a uniform gray image without any features whatsoever. So that was not an option. Instead, I discovered that what does work is going through all my cameras in a round-robin fashion. That is to have actually four motion.conf files, one, two, three, four, one for each camera, and going through them in a round-robin fashion and, and trying to look through each of them and saving their results. 
That does work and I shall describe in a minute how to set that up. But bear in mind that you're having here not only software issues but you are dealing also with hardware issues and you will almost certainly run into them if you're using more than one, best case, two cameras. Well, configuration itself uh, in the main way happens in the motion.con files. Camera specific stuff goes into the corresponding camera file or files. I have done it here so that each motion conf has only one camera and that's it. Now let's look into, for instance, motion. 3.conf. Let's not take the first one because the first one will be giving you misguiding ideas if you try to have more than one camera. So, motion, as I mentioned, can run as a demon. Now, I did not want that because I am starting and stopping motion permanently. That was not a very good idea. Then, what is also interesting is you set your target directory. Where would you like to have your photos and possibly videos in? I picked here a directory straight under the root slash because I want to browse that easily on the SD card if I ever mount it separately. You also have a log file, motion.log, which I however found only medium helpful. I was dealing with a nasty problem I shall return to a bit later on and that did not actually help me at all. So let's go further through the specifications. When you freshly install Motion, it has that active, that the video device shall be dev video zero. Now, evidently, if you're having more than one camera, then that won't be dev video zero at all times. Just the first one will be zero, but the second one will be two, the third one will be four, and your fourth camera will be 6. So they do not go 0, 1, 2, 3, but they go 0, 2, 4, 6. Bear that in mind if you configure more than one camera. You will see that just in a moment. Uh, then you set up various, you know, um, other parameters. Here you also have predefined um, image sizes, like in white and height. But that is something you better set up, not in a global fashion, but in a per camera fashion. So I prefer not to have that in the main motion.com file, but to have it elsewhere. And then you're having, yeah, what it shall be um, emulating motion. That's not a very important setting, but an important setting is actually the threshold. Now that directly depends on, on the size and pixels that you will be configuring for for the camera and the threshold tells you basically how many pixels shall change so that motion is registered and how much they shall change is determined by the noise level like what is just a normal camera variation that shall not cause um, a pixel change to be registered. Like if you point at the sky, then you know it will not always be the exactly same blue blue hue in in the in each pixel at all times. So you're having here, in fact, the determiners of when motion shall be registered. And evidently, the higher the threshold is, the harder it is to register motion. The lower it is, the easier motion will be registered, but beware, you don't actually want that. You don't want that each bird that passes is triggering a motion. You don't want that each leaf in front of the window uh, causes a motion. So, so don't set that too high. I note that between 10 and 20% of the picture area should be set as a threshold. This is what works best for me. You can also go down to 5%, but you shouldn't go lower. If you go into the 1% or 2% area, then basically anything immediately causes motion and you immediately get bombarded with pictures. In the beginning that may sound cool, but later on you will realize that's extremely annoying because you get a lot of trash pictures in reality. Then you're having... Uh, yeah, an event gap and uh, pre and post pictures. Now, this tells you how many pictures to capture 
so to say before and after an event has been detected. The idea being that when motion registers a motion, it might be that something interesting happened just before that or just will happen afterwards. So that you're having here a little bit of flexibility. I noted that this is not very helpful in practice, like you don't care all that much about it. So I set both to zero. And how long shall an event uh, be? Now, an event like a motion event that you say, how long does it take? This is all in seconds, it says an event takes a minute. Now, an important thing to note is that motion will take three possible things. Either motion triggered images, or periodic snapshots just due to the passage of time without any motion being detected, as well as videos. Videos I discovered to be the by far least useful because they take a lot of space and a lot of time to review and they don't give you much benefit. So you'll say, see that little shaking which caused the motion, but you don't actually care that much about it. Pictures are better. Your file browser will show you previews and you can browse hundreds of pictures in a matter of seconds. If you have to deal with tens of videos already, you'll be exhausted. So it's best not to have videos, to have pictures and to decide whether you would like to have, uh, like in what parameters you would like to have it. Picture output is the thing which lets us have pictures and you also get to determine here the picture quality. I discovered experimentally, like these are all JPEGs, that 35 and higher work okay. Uh, you shouldn't go too high because your pictures can suddenly become half a megabyte, one megabyte, like this is ridiculous. So keep that as low as you practically can. 55 is a bit of a luxury I allowed myself, 35 will be decidedly uh, more economic. And you also get to determine how often they get taken, the minimum frame time. That is, no pictures will be taken sooner after each other than 10 seconds. You can set that to one if you would like to have them taken each second but you will quickly discover that this is absolute overkill. So here you can even go for a minute if you would like to. 10 seconds, 15 seconds I discovered to be nicely practical. So you get different snapshots of the motion, like for instance, I don't know, some guy going through your garden, but you do not um, get to, to be bombarded with, oh my God, there's a guy in your garden. Oh my God, let's look at every step he takes. Then, <laughs> then you're having here the snapshot interval, which is telling you how often shall a picture be taken without any motion being registered. Why would you want to do that? Well, first of all, in order to see that motion is working at all, that would be an easy way to signal it. Second of all, you might have surveillance needs of things that will not cause a motion detection, but that are still important to know. For instance, if you're having a remote house and the pipe breaks and starts to flood the wall, then the flooding might become just so slow or so sharply defined that it does not actually cause a motion detection in, in any bigger area, but you nonetheless would like to know that, or you might detect thereby dripping from the roof or things like that. So having a periodic image turns out to be actually extremely helpful, and I would say more helpful than the motion detected ones, but more to that in a moment. And here having the movie output, I really do advise you to set that to off. Like, yeah, you get little movies and you see little movements and in the end you really don't care and you wish you wouldn't be bombarded with that. Then you can have some web control and whatnot. I mean, I really just turn that off. Uh, I'm not going to sit in front of the monitor and stare, um, stare through the camera. I would like to get pictures and I would like to be done with it. And now here, the interesting part, which cameras are controlled through which configuration files. Now, you can set here more than one. In fact, you can activate all four. Initially, they are set under user, but I prefer to just have them under ATC. But, as I told you, while motion will allow that in software, the hardware of the Pi won't allow that. And if you activate here all of them, then motion will try to work with all of them and they will simply deliver you gray images. 
uh, I don't know why that exactly is and, and how exactly otherwise it can be combated but I discovered the best is to just have one camera per motion file and to restart motion periodically with each camera so that is pretty much um, <laughs> pretty much it that that is what your main motion configuration file in the relevant parts looks like so you know that you need to set a threshold a distance between pictures and a camera configuration file these are somehow your most important parameters here now let me quickly walk you through the settings of one camera let's take camera 4 less camera4.conf we just looked at motion3conf so camera3conf would be fitting but let's take 4conf so you see a little bit of differences in case you would like to variate now you give it a name you give it an ID this this is here the first one is 101 then I took 102 103 and 104 and here interesting is the video device that's perhaps the most important thing that it is not video 0 and not video 4 not video 3 it's video 6 and then the size of the image this is perhaps the most important setting in here as well as some text you would like to have on the image this is all going to be on the lower end of the image um, some some form of description I like to just have a camera for like who took it and then just a year month date hour minute second setting that I also take actually for the picture this is the motion detector detected picture file name like I could call it here motion if I wanted to but uh, because this is a motion file anyway I just didn't care but what I did care was marking snapshots these periodic images without uh, motion as snapshots so I know nothing happened there this is just periodic alright so that is how motion is configured and all the pictures will be stored in photos uh, I am actually using that now with a somewhat different setup but you can see that it is indeed full of stuff alright <laughs> now that we have seen the ba basic storage of things what do you do with it uh, where does it go like uh, pff, cool you have pictures now what well I found it the most reasonable to send myself these pictures by email and doing so I am using a simple SMTP program which is uh, configured actually much easier than postfix and, and friends and which you will configure under I believe uh, etc ss mtp yes and yeah I have here an anonymous one in order to uh, have basically the the basic configuration which which you do undertake under ssmtp.conf but I have instead created here an anonymous version which I can show you so let's have a look at this so now let's look at our ssmtp.con file you define here some um, some email which I say is like some mail at some provider dot somewhere and you set it up like this and and your mail hub and you say that the domain shall be like written and the host name which which apparently works like that including the whole email and not just uh, um, some other part <laughs> uh, and then you override the from line and so on the configuration is really just quite simple like you really just have a couple of things to set and what is very important to note is that your authentication password is something which dependent on the provider might be called an app password like Gmail is calling it that way and, and other providers too 
Nowadays, uh, it has become more usual that you do not use your main login password in order to get such mails by apps, but that email providers are issuing to you, and that really depends on the settings of your email provider, a password which to use in order to get your emails by programs. So that means if you put here just simply your uh, normal login password in, in clear text and everything, <laughs> uh, that might not be working. So please check your provider where you would like to, uh, like which you would like to use for this exercise, whether you need a special app password. And if you do, that is the thing you will be using here. Ports, yeah, depends also on the provider, of course, right? So that, in fact, is everything. The, the configuration file is not very long and it is significantly simpler than, than um, Postfix. In fact, we can even cat it, perhaps. p.anon.conf and just take the uncommented lines in order to to show you what you need. So that is really all that is needed in that configuration file. So you can see that's really not not hard to do. And there's also another file called ref aliases and I will also show you again the anonymous version of it. It's actually brief, it just gives you sort of a rewriting thing of uh, who shall be counted as a root and who shall be counted as the user pi. Oh. So it is just again the email that you that you picked, right? And having done that, you can already send um, mails through a program called MailX. Right, I shouldn't be having mail now, yes. Uh, you, you can use that in order to send emails and you can use that in order to, to transmit the information you're having to somewhere. And how is this done? Well, I have written here a couple of scripts which I'm then using uh, for automatization purposes. So let's go there and let's have a look at the relevant one. So yes, we're going to look at transmit pic. So you have now taken the pictures, you have configured your email program and you would like to send them to yourself. By the way, I warmly advise you to send them to a separate email address, like to not use your main email address in any of this at all, but to create some sort of surveillance email address somewhere that you will use just for that purpose. And so if we say now, uh, let's have a look, <laughs> then you are having here, yeah, it's a bash script evidently and it is doing something uh, quite simple. Um, it is first of all creating a tar archive uh, out of the photos because the photos can be really a lot and you want to know what to attach. So you're creating a TGZ archive. Now you might ask yourself why aren't we going for zip because that is something you can perhaps more easily open everywhere. The problem is many mail providers do not permit you to send zip files. Gmail was making me issues with that in the past too. But TGZ seems to be still universally accepted. And if you're having the 7-zip program, which should exist on Linux, uh, Windows and Macintosh, then you should be able to, to un untar that, that is to open this without issues. Then you are creating the archive. You're echoing uh, some some text, right? And and then you are like um, like as a, as a sort of uh, <laughs> message. And then you are using the mail X program with a subject line of snapshots, like that's just simply how the mail will be called. And you're attaching then with a big A the photos TGZ. I say big A because other mail programs have a little A but MailX is using a big A for the attachments. 
and then you're sending that I'm sending that to to myself. Yeah, you, you can send that also to some other email address, but why bother having two if you can have just one? So you're all the time sending emails to yourself. Why I advise that? Well, because that way you uh, you avoid potential issues with oh my god, you're a potential spammer, and uh, we will block your email account. That has sometimes happened to me in the past with such machinations. And evidently, if you cannot see what is happening, uh, you, you become effectively blind unless you trigger that script several times with several email addresses. And then after having sent that, uh, I, I give it just a short break and then I delete the pictures. Now, in a previous vi uh, variant, I was not deleting the pictures in all cases, but I was having here a double end, like double ampersand sign, that is delete them only if the email sending process was successful. Trouble is, then the pictures start to accumulate, and at some point they become so many that it is impossible for you to actually send them within valid attachment limits and like the photos TGZ simply becomes too big and that then condition never triggers like you never you never get to have a successful email transmission which means you will never delete your pictures and that on the other hand makes you effectively blind forever so don't do that rather risk getting rid of your photos or at least part of them I mean usually it doesn't matter all that much, like if I use, lose a couple of photos, so I just keep it simple. But be aware to, to not have an explosion of pictures eventually that you cannot transmit anywhere. And here you understand also why I warned you from configuring motion to take videos or too many pictures. You won't be actually able to send them to yourself if you overdo it. Well, so we now know how to transmit the pictures. How do I actually uh, trigger my cameras? Well, the manner in which I'm doing it with motion is through the ca script cameras sh. And you know what, no, we will talk about that in a second. First of all, let me show you something else. If you have too many pictures, I have created actually another script uh, which is send if too many. Now it might be that due to motion detection your pictures simply become too many and if you have an average idea of um, how big a picture is then you might set some file limit that you say hey if the pictures become that many we are in danger of um, overrunning available image space so force a transmission please that is even if you say that pictures shall be transmitted periodically you might also want to to check at shorter intervals than the predefined period and send the pictures simply if they become if there is a too too large amount of them in your chosen image directory what i'm doing here is to just determine the file count test my limit against the file count uh, and then transmit the pictures. Actually, uh, <laughs> that one even seems to, to have a bug. This should be here an exit because I <laughs> put the exit down here. Doesn't matter much. You, you essentially trigger transmit picture sh if, if the count is too large. So, yeah, that's about it. That's not, not a complex thing. Now, we now know how to send pictures in a, in a normal fashion and how to trigger that script, which is actually transmit pic sh, if there are too many pictures. And now let's look at camera sh, which is how I handle motion. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, the, the way I have actually set this up 
is that I prefer a different program than Motion, which is called FS Webcam, and which you can also just apt install, in order to take periodic pictures. Now, this can be set up to either generally take periodic pictures or to just take one picture and be done with it, which is what I'm doing here with all of my four cameras, which you can nicely see here on the video devices, 0, 2, 4 and 6. Each of them are just taking a picture called according to the date, like we're here in the photos directory, and then with, if you notice, the back ticks, we're having here the date command being issued in a format which will just give me a file name. So I'm getting here cam underscore periodic underscore date and time.gpack and then I am triggering motion each time with a little sleep in order to uh, free the USB bus because I noticed that if you take two pictures immediately one after the other then you still might get a gray image so put at least a sleep one there in order to free somehow the resource and what I'm then doing is I am starting motion not in daemon mode with the respective configuration file letting it run for a couple of seconds like 430 here then I'm giving it um, a signal to to quit and if it does not quit voluntarily I slaughter it and that's what I'm doing with each of these. Here you can see it with uh, motion 2 and motion 3 and motion 4. So that's simply what is happening four times, each for each motion. And that is how this script is working for a period of time, which I have set here to, to two runs each one running essentially for something like seven and a half minutes a little bit less than that in order to avoid having overlappings right so that's not exactly adding up to 450 because I would like to have a couple of of seconds left at the end of the hour in order to have a very clean shutdown of everything I was also considering to reset the USB ports periodically but in the end, for now, I'm, I'm not doing that. That is not necessary if actually the cameras don't block. And because I have set them here at proper time intervals, they don't block, so, so there will be no resetting of the USB ports. And that script once run will give me one hour of periodic triggering of motion, stopping of motion, you know, killing it. And, and going to, to the next camera respectively, you know, like here's motion three and so on. So that is how I'm doing each time a one hour surveillance of my target area. And that whole thing, so we now know have the target surveillance in camera SH, which will give me the photos in, in the sla slash photos directory, which will then be transmitted through transmit pick SH and if there are too many, we're going to use sendif too many .sh in order to send them somewhere. Now let's look at the cron tab file through which I am periodically sending my stuff. Now this is a copy of the original cron tab file because in the end I use something different. But let, let me just walk you through it for a moment. Then you will, will really have the complete setup and then I'll tell you how I actually do it differently. Oh, yes, it is with ETC. So, there we go. Um, it's actually rather simple. There is a periodic reboot at 23.52 in order to give the system enough time to actually boot up again. Now, this is something fundamental about consumer electronics. You cannot go for reliability. You can only go for periodic restarts. No matter what I did, my old Raspberry Pi system, I admit from 2013, was all the time hanging after something like two or three months. Now, let's say that you would like to surveil some, some place which is staying alone most of the year. 
then essentially you're facing a situation like NASA with a satellite or something. It's up there. There isn't much you can do. It's very expensive to go there. So instead of trying to have my system run as long as possible, I found it much more convenient to shut it down periodically, once daily, and to give it each time a fresh start. So I clearly advise you to do something like that rather than just, you know, letting it run and hoping that it will have a big uptime. Just simply expect it to fail. Then you're having here every six hours, but you could also go for every two hours, four hours, eight hours, depending on what you set up the transmit pick script being triggered. So this is our periodical normal uh, picture transmission that you're saying, you know, nothing big is happening. Every six hours you're getting an email package. Every five minutes though, we are checking whether the count of pictures exploded that much that it would be necessary to, to send pictures intermittently. So an archive, just like in transmit pick sh will be created, like write this script, triggers that script, and then you're going to get your pictures earlier than in the six hours, though you, of course you will get them also at the six hours intervals. In fact, in the past sometimes it has happened to me that this triggered just before that, so then I'm getting an email which is either empty or having one or two pictures in the, in the target, uh, in the TGZ file. Another thing to to consider, which I do here, depending on some sensible interval, is to have a keep alive ping. In particular, if you're having a mobile connection, I discovered in the past that sometimes it was just not being established reliably enough. That is, my mobile operator was somehow shutting me down, and if I need internet, it would activate it again, but that turned out to be pretty buggy. So instead of that, I prefer to have them assume that I'm always online. And I'm pinging here Google's DNS server 10 times every five minutes. I'm not overusing that, right? Uh, and, and just thereby keeping my net connection. And hourly, I am restarting that motion script, which I showed you just, where the cameras are being activated in a round robin fashion and where snapshots are just being made before the activation of each camera of all four cameras so that I have a good overview. At least every seven and a half minutes I'm getting a picture, but other than that, if motion is activated. And that's all about the first setup where you're using motion in order to detect motion and send yourself pictures. But as I mentioned, that is not what I finally I'm doing right now because I discovered one fundamental issue with motion that you shall keep in mind in case you would like to use that. Motion, once started, the four, first four minutes pretty much does absolutely nothing. You can move in front of the camera, you can dance in front of the camera, nothing happens, nothing is recorded, nothing is noted, there is no registration of your movement, and the first four minutes are sort of wasted. So if you go through cameras in a round robin fashion, very quickly you notice that you decrease your observation period. So if we am ha looking um, at half an hour, you know, then that means if, if in half an hour I want to trigger four cameras, that means there's a 16 minute period in which I'm essentially blind because motion won't, won't react. I only have the periodic images. So, rather than bothering with motion, I went for a much simpler setup in the end, which works very nicely, and that is simply to take periodic pictures, which is happening through camerasperiodic.sh, and there I need no motion, <laughs> but merely I am looking at each camera in distances of 90 seconds. And the last one is a little bit less than that in order to uh, let the whole thing terminate just before the end of the hour. And that's all I do. That is extremely set easy to set up. You're having here just the FS webcam program, which I mentioned previously. 
which is just taking periodic pictures, just giving them a file name, and that's it. And while that does not react on motion, it gives me, in fact, a closer observation time. Like, you will have to, to be very, very fast in order to intrude within within this interval. It means that every six minutes, every camera is activated once with FS webcam. You, you can even close down these intervals to something to something smaller. And you're not so long effectively blind. You can really regulate here this time distance between the cameras for as low as you would like to have it. You can have a look every minute of every camera if you go down here for 15 seconds. So practically, while that is less glamorous and less glorious, that is perhaps the easier solution than actually going for motion. And just having that gives you also a predictable count of images. Yeah, you see, this is the entire script. There isn't really more to it. Uh, that gives you a predictable count of images, though. So you do not need to, to send if there are too many, because that will not happen. You're having periodic images, not motion-activated ones. And that is what I'm really doing. So that is what my real cron tab looks like now. Simpler than the motion setup. I am again periodically rebooting. I am transmitting the pictures every four hours. And I am issuing a keep alive ping every five minutes as before. And I am just running a periodic observation. So if you would like to have something much simpler than fussing around with motion, then FS webcam definitely is your friend. So, that's about it. Now you have the complete configuration and you're ready to set up your own Raspberry Pi observation station if you would be so in the mood. Gosh, now that we walked through so many scripts and configuration files, we truly need to clean our eyes a little. So, here you have again an image of something beautiful. And, well, thank you for joining me and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Next one, we shall be looking at a simpler version perhaps for you to set this up. Namely, using ESP32 boards. For now, I wish you to have a great day and I hope to see you soon. Goodbye.